What's up, family? It's your boy Danny, alive and in the flesh, back reminding you that you are beautiful enough, you are strong enough, and you are capable enough, which means that you are good enough for whatever schemes the fates and the furies cook up and send your way. And you're gonna stay that way because you're gonna eat meat, move weight, and you ain't gonna piss off any hippos. Now we've got one life to live, and we've got one body to live it in and I wanna help you do that. If this is your first time here and you wanna learn how to think about your body and your mind, if you wanna bring them under your control, if you wanna learn the best techniques for evaluating the claims that other people are making about your body and your mind, and if you wanna learn how to do all these things in the most efficient manner possible so that you're able to apply your energies where you get the most bang for your buck, well, Hold on to your socks and smash that subscribe button. In addition to dropping knowledge for free and bringing you enlightenment and delivering it, I also like to occasionally poke fun at vegans and make some response videos, which is what we're gonna do today. In this video of Earthling Eds, we have a very weak and very motley collection of what I am hesitating to call arguments. This video is filled with more errors than it is words. That's some serious vegan voodoo. The omnivore argument is a commonly used justification for killing and eating animals. Assuming that we need any justification at all, that is begging the question, is a pretty common informal fallacy that vegans use to uh, avoid the hard work of meta-ethics. Eddie believes that there's something called the omnivore argument that humans often use to justify their meat eating and it goes something like this. Humans are natural omnivores and we also have canine teeth which are perfectly designed for us to shred and kill an animal. That's why we're morally justified to take their life and to eat them. Creatures that resemble omnivores can justifiably consume animals. Humans resemble omnivores. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Wait, I mean, therefore, humans can justifiably consume animals. There's a couple of ways of looking at this argument. Okay, fine, Ed, you got us. We will ignore the blatant question begging and we will let you lay out your two ways of looking at the argument. Let's see what he has to say about this first way. Now, many people believe that actually humans aren't naturally omnivorous. And in fact, we're more closely related to herbivores or even frugivores. Those people, they are not so smart. Those people may in fact believe this sincerely and it might not just be some grift. However, they believe it sincerely in spite of massive mountains of evidence that indicate that human beings are in fact facultative or non-obligate carnivores that possess a vestigial and lingering ability to digest starch. People point to some of our physical attributes like the fact that we have incredibly long intestines, significantly longer than natural omnivores and natural meat eaters. O-M-M-F-G! I just don't know how many times I'm gonna have to murder this myth. We do not have long intestines. Watch this video for a lengthy rebuttal. For now, suffice it to say, lions, five, man, 10 to 12, horses, 12, cattle, 20, elephant seals, 25. We don't have long intestines. Elephant seals have long intestines, 25 times their body length, and they are obligate carnivores. What about the other way around? Pandas are vegetarians with carnivore guts. Vegans are like human pandas. Four to one. Sloths? Who doesn't like sloths? Sloths? Sloths. Sloths, sloths. Also a vegetarian, clocking in at a measly two to one. Their intestines are twice as long as their body. There is no rhyme or re, well, there's very little rhyme or reason to any of this. And the only way you can sift through all the madness is by actually doing comparative anatomy. We also have very weak hydrochloric acid in our stomach. <laughs> this one takes the cake. Uh, there is no such thing as a weak hydrochloric acid. <laughs> like literally, by definition, uh, a simple Google search goes a long way, Eddie. In fact, there are only seven, seven count them, strong acids. So few in number that most people when they're in chemistry class just learn to memorize all seven of them. All of the other acids are weak. Hydrochloric acid? Not weak. Unlike this bullshit video, man, you better come correct, Holmes. Taking this point even further, we're gonna drive it all the way home, get out of the car, walk it to the front door, and give it a kiss goodnight. 
The truth is, my bros and brodettes, is that we actually have stronger stomachs than hyenas. That's right, and most vultures and most scavengers. In fact, we would literally do well and thrive as scavengers. Our claws or our nails are incredibly blunt and not at all effective at tearing apart an animal. Oh, our claws and our nails, they're not effective at tearing apart an animal? Well, you know what's effective at tearing apart an animal? Butchers, like my dad. Hey dad, he's a vegan actually, weird, huh? Are our bodies naturally effective at agriculture? No, that's why we use animals like oxen. Husbandry is the precondition for agriculture and not the reverse. We encephalized, we grew our big brains as a result of hunting and eating animals, which we then utilized our big brains to domesticate animals, who we then exploited or employed, if you prefer a euphemism, to grow plants and domesticate crops. This is the order it happens in and never the reverse. It's logically impossible. Our teeth as well and the way that our jaws work is they move from side to side and they grind rather than tearing and ripping like a natural animal eater does. Uh, you might want to get that shit checked out, homie. That, that sounds like TMJ or something. And while we're talking about our teeth, it's very important to mention our canines. People point at our canines and use them as a justification for why we are morally allowed to kill and eat an animal. But our canines are incredibly blunt and incredibly rudimentary. Since this video is allegedly about our dentation, allow me to retort. There is considerable variation in dental anatomy among animals. In mammals, there are two distinct types of teeth that differ in both pattern of growth and morphology. Brachydonts, 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 our low crown teeth are what is seen in man carnivores, such as dogs and cats and pigs. Notice how the two are grouped together there. Um, this type of tooth consists of a crown above a gingiva, a constricted neck at the gum line, and a root embedded in the jawbone. The crown is encased in enamel and the root in cementum. Enamel is the hardest substance in the body, being densely packed with hydroxyapatite, which is a mineral crystal, hydroxyapatite hydroxy hydroxy crystal, and heavily mineralized with calcium salts. Yet, it is still destroyed by the allegedly weak, according to special ed, hydrochloric acid in our stomachs. Cementum is calcified connective tissue. Dentin, a bone-like material, is under the enamel and makes up most of the tooth. The pulp cavity includes blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. Hypsodonts, or high crown teeth, continue to erupt through life. That's because as they're ground down, they keep pushing out of the gum. Examples of this type include all the permanent teeth of horses and the cheek teeth of ruminants. Hmm, herbivores. Hypsodont teeth are usually described as having a body, much of which is below the gum line and root, which is embedded in the alveolus of the jawbone. Enamel covers the entire body of the tooth. That means even below the gum line, because they're designed to wear down and push up. A lot of mammalian carnivores and omniv omnivores, regardless of phylogenetic relationships, have a type of molar called brachydont. Bunodont quadrate molars. Nearly every true omnivore has them. All apes have them, so do pigs, bears, raccoons, hedgehogs, and others. So why these kinds of teeth specifically? Because this shape is optimal for crushing stuff, which is what omnivores need most rather than grinding stuff like herbivores do. It's almost like our teeth, our anatomy, our mouths, our digestive system all point like all seem to indicate that we're facultative carnivores who can eat anything in a pinch. The real elephant in the room here, besides that one, <laughs> is that this part of our anatomy, our mouths, our jaws, our dentation, they all reflect the singular most important and defining trait of human beings. And this issue dwarfs the issue of diet. I'm of course talking about speech. We're wired for sounds, dudes. The fact that we can speak is the real story here, and not the fact that our digestive system might indicate that we're on the border of omnivory and facultative carnivorousness. Just so we can say that we put this issue to bed, tucked it in, and kissed it goodnight, let me be crystal clear here. Anybody that isn't taking into account both of these things, that is what we should eat and how we talk, 
isn't really doing comparative anatomy. And the reason that we have our canines is to help us bite into hard, crunchy fruits and vegetables like apples. First of all, we've already established that that fruit and veg that you're talking about didn't exist until we ate meat, encephalized, and then exploited animal labor to produce agricultural products. Secondly, bro, like, are your teeth okay? Like, you need your canines to eat an apple? Like, I think you should go to a dentist. Like, first your jaw's all like cattywampus, dude, and then now you're telling me like you're struggling to eat apples? In fact, natural herbivores do possess canines. Yes, they do, but what they don't have are brachydont, bunodont, quadrate molars like carnivores and omnivores do. And in fact, the largest canines of any land animal on this planet belong to the hippopotamus, who is completely herbivorous, who is completely herbivorous. And that really kind of puts to rest the idea that our canines allow us to kill and eat an animal because the hippo consumes absolutely no animal flesh, consumes absolutely no animal flesh. yet they have the largest canines of any land animal, significantly larger than any lion or tiger or jaguar or panther, significantly larger than any natural animal eater. Okay, so here's where Ed got the hippo thing from, but here's uh, where I got the thing from actual scientists who have thoroughly documented both hippo cannibalism and all kinds of varied meat eating uh, behaviors that they engage in. So. It's called Hungry Hungry Hippos for a reason, yo. Anyway, basic Pyrrhonism and like just good common sense dictates that any time that you find like something on Google that uh, makes your little reward center in your brain light up like a Christmas tree because you're confirming one of your biases <laughs> or biases, um, dictates that you should also, while you're on Google, like look up the opposite viewpoint and maybe make sure that the other side doesn't have a better argument. Please and thanks. Okay, so, so far it really sounds like according to Earthling Ed, it definitely matters what we're like naturally adapted for eating. It sounds to me like he thinks facultative carnivores should probably eat a species appropriate diet. But to be honest, I find all of this entirely irrelevant. In my opinion, it doesn't matter for natural omnivores, herbivores, or frugivores. Well, why didn't you just say so at the beginning of the video? So even if we are natural omnivores, we're not, we're facultative carnivores. Because we can live off plants alone, that depends depends on how you define both life and plants alone. I cannot live off plants alone. It means it's entirely unnecessary for us to take the life of an animal. Says you, Mr. Begs the question. Because we can survive, get all the energy and all the nutrients that we need from a vegan diet. No, no we can't, uh-uh. Here's Dr. Joel Kahn's supplement page. Does it look like we can get everything we need from a vegan diet? And that's coming from a vegan. It means it's completely unjustifiable and immoral to take the life of an animal, regardless of whether they're omnivores, herbivores, or frugivores. Right, but we're facultative carnivores. Just because we have the physical capability to do something does not provide moral justification to do it. Nothing and nobody provides moral justification for anyone to do anything ever. Bud, that's why people invent gods and religions. I know I've said it before, but demanding justification is blatant question begging. It's the metaphysical equivalent of asking someone when they stopped beating their wife. First, explain why we need to justify this behavior. I'm not even sure who Eddie thinks that we're justifying himself to in his vegan imagination. God, the animals? Walt Disney? I will say that if he thinks that we need to justify ourselves to him and his vegan pals. Well, you two boys can just right off. Lions don't need justification. Well, we aren't lions. Well, no sh we're human. Is there something special about the water that we're made up of? Oh, there is, you say? Well, then why were we comparing ourselves to animals to begin with, seems like a bit of a bait and switch. People wanna feel like they're living in harmony with some thing or some principle that's bigger than their own self. You aren't and you can't. Man is the measure or the measurer of all things. So speak softly and carry a big ruler. A ruler that's big enough to bash somebody over the head with if they tell you that your ruler is ugly or crooked or stupid or that you should be using their ruler instead. People also wanna feel like they have some sort of divine sanction for their actions. If you're following the laws of your society and you're not a complete dickwad to everyone all the time, 
You're doing fine, dude. You're good, in fact, but not some kind of like cosmic good where God's gonna give you or you're gonna get some divine pat on the head. Just the normal, everyday, he's I kind of good. These traits of human beings, this desire for divine warrant and the feeling of being in harmony with all living things, these are the traits that all frauds, grifters, con men, and salesmen target in all their schemes. Special Ed here is particularly good at it. In fact, watch a few of his videos. They are works of art. Dark and foreboding classical string music layered over video footage that's also dark and foreboding of the excesses of factory farms. The goal is to make you feel like something is amiss. Something is wrong with the universe. Something is wrong with you. It's also the goal to inculcate some sense of dread or despair or manufacture a need that only the salesman or his product can fix, an anxiety that only he can alleviate, the tension of shame and guilt, followed by the release of expiation or ablation or absolution for your sins, whether this is through confession in religion or consumption with the capitalist. Either way, the goal, the trick is the exact same. You ain't gonna find any of that shit here, brother. You don't need to buy anything and you don't need to be absolved of any sins. As long as you're not a criminal asshole, you're beautiful enough, you're strong enough, and you're capable enough, which means that you're good enough as you are. You can actually be released from this destructive cycle if you only realize that you're holding on to it. It's not holding on to you. All of nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat in the active and passive if we choose to restrain ourselves, if we choose not to eat, or if we choose to dive headlong and balls deep into Jainism, that's our prerogative as the dominant species on the planet. We can ahimsa until the cows come home or until we stop killing them. But remember that killing and eating is how we got here and there's no erasing that fact. It's that sweet, fundamental Freudian guilt of father slaying that no amount of veganism can ever absolve us of. We float blissfully on a vast ocean of horrifying suffering. Vegans think that they're on the shore, screaming at us to wake up and get out, when really they're just in a rickety old boat called the USS Vegan. They don't see all the holes and the rust on their sinking ship. All right, fam, that's it for today. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Do we need to justify our meat-eating behavior? If so, to whom? Vegan fam, does the fact that we are facultative carnivores, you know what, in fact, just assume that we are, would that justify taking the life of an animal? Is necessity the mother of absolution? It's your boy Danny reminding you to eat meat, move weight, and don't with hippos. Chuck a deuce.